أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We start our discussion this evening by examining Tradition 2.20.3 on page 401 in our book. That's page 401, Tradition 2.20.3. This hadith is from Sulaiman ibn Harun, one of the companions of Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. He says, Qala sami'tu Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. I heard the Imam state the following. In this hadith, Al Imam al Sadiq highlights the significance of knowing the prerequisites and the conditions of laws. Just like you ought to know the law, you ought to know the prerequisites and the conditions of that law. And scholars spend most of their efforts trying to figure out the conditions for laws. Some laws are clear, but the conditions are not that clear. So the Imam says, مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ حَلَالًا وَحَرَامًا إِلَّا وَلَهُ حَدٌّ كَحَدِّ الدَّارِ Every lawful and unlawful thing that Allah has stipulated for humanity has limits like the property limits of a house. When you have a house, it has property limits. There's a pathway that takes you to the house. There's a door through which you enter. The house is different than the surrounding limits of the property. فَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الطَّرِيقِ فَهُوَ مِنَ الطَّرِيقِ That which is in the street or part of the street is outside the property limits. It's not the house yet. That which is outside the sidewalk, the driveway that's going into your house, we're still not in the property. وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الدَّارِ فَهُوَ مِنَ الدَّارِ And that which is part of the house is part of the house. The Imam is just giving a very basic example here that laws are like this property example. You have the law itself like the house and then you have prerequisites to get to the law. Just like you need to take the street, then go to the alley, then go through the driveway, then go through the door to get to the house. Right? You don't just teleport into the house. There's a path that you need to take. Laws of Allah, whether they're halal or haram, also have paths that take you to them. Then in the end of the hadith, the Imam السلام, states, حَتَّى أَرْشَ الْخَدْشِ فَمَا سِوَاهِ وَالْجَلْدَةِ وَنِصْفِ الْجَلْدَةِ The Imam السلام, says, even a scratch and less than a scratch and a lash and half a lash, these are the uh, punitive uh, aspects of our legal system or the system of retribution where you basically scratch someone. The Imam says even these minute laws, you scratch someone, it's not really a significant thing, right? Even that in the law of God has conditions and prerequisites that you need to be aware of. So this hadith is highlighting the importance of knowing the terms and conditions of God's laws. This is something most people are not aware of. We know the law. We know Salat al-Subuh is two rak'ahs. This is how you pray. We know that. But what are the conditions and prerequisites of the prayer, of the wudu, of the ghusl, of the clothing? We know that dealing with interest is haram, selling alcohol is haram, but when it comes to business, what are the prerequisites? What are the terms and conditions in God's law? Most people are not aware of that. The Imam says, we basically have to be aware of these conditions and limits in order to uphold the law and practice it. And many of these obligations have a lot of prerequisites and limits. For instance, one hadith states, Salah has 4,000 limits. Now 4,000 is a combination of mustahab limits and wajib limits. 4,000 terms and conditions about salah. 
that have been stated in the hadith. How much of these do I know? 10%, 5%, 1%? It's important to know them. Because a lot of them, maybe a good 500 to 1,000 of them are wajib that I need to know. The vast majority of people are not aware of the conditions of a law, the prerequisites of the law. And when it comes to the application, they make mistakes. They think they're following the law, but they're not observing the terms and the conditions. Today when you buy anything, you engage in any business transaction. Have you seen there's three pages of the fine print, terms and conditions. Well why? Why do you think in our legal world we have three, four pages, sometimes if you're working on a biz, big business contract, you could have 20 pages of uh, terms and conditions. Why? What's the purpose of terms and conditions? Are they there to torture you and put you through pain to read it with a magnifying glass? What's the point of them? <laughs> the brother says, yes, that's what they're for. But, what, but seriously, why do we have that in society? Knowing your to control, keep within the bounds. To control, keep within the bounds, protect the law from being abused, taken advantage of, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. It's the same with religious laws. Everything Allah has mentioned in the Quran has conditions. Yes, Allah mentions in the Holy Quran the lashing of the one who commits adultery. Of course, the Quran does not mention stoning in the Quran. In the Quran, Allah mentions the lashing, but that has conditions. There's terms and conditions of when that is applicable, when that's not applicable. Another verse that commonly you find critics of Islam pointing out to is the verse that says, cut the hands of the thief. Well, that has so many conditions, tens and tens and tens of conditions. Some scholars put it at 40 conditions before this is applicable. See, people, don't, don't, people are not aware of that. The Qur'an is the contract between us and Allah, but it has terms and conditions. You take that from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Don't forget that. And have you seen the terms and conditions sometimes are bigger than the actual contract that you're sign signing? Sometimes you're signing a contract, it's a page. Just put your name, read something, basically it's simple, a paragraph, and then you flip over, you see 20 pages of terms and conditions. <laughs> Same with Quran, Quran is 600 pages. But you'll have thousands of pages in hadith, terms and conditions. Kafi is one of them, my dear brothers and sisters. We study the terms and conditions of God's laws, of the Holy Quran. I cannot, those who say the Quran's enough, they're eliminating all these terms and conditions. Would you do that in the business world? If you come up with a contract and your client, your customer says, you know what, let me throw this in the trash. I don't need it. This is enough. I'm looking at the actual contract. I don't want to look at those terms and conditions. I'm not going to sign on them. You will not find that acceptable. The Quran that was revealed by Allah came with terms and conditions. You have no right to implement the Qur'an without knowing the terms of conditions. Otherwise, you will be straying away further than from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will be end up doing damage. No one can say the Qur'an is sufficient. Let me just look at it, take out a dictionary, see what the word means, khalas, I'll go with it. You, you could be violating hundreds of terms and conditions. So this is a beautiful hadith from an Imam al-Sadiq salam in which he communicates this idea to us. That you need to know the terms of conditions. That requires expertise if you're an expert. Requires asking a scholar if I'm not an expert. Asking an expert. Any thoughts about this hadith? We need to talk about this hadith more. In the <laughs> yes, this should be discussed more. Next time you find someone trying to prove something, giving you their philosophy by citing a verse from the Quran, whether it's about hijab, haram, haram, halal, haram, food, whatever it is, right? Just remind them of this hadith and tell them there are terms and conditions. If you've studied them and you've, look, you've looked at them and you know what they are as an expert, by all means I respect your opinion. You're entitled to give your perspective. But if you have not read the terms of conditions, do not come and give your opinion here. Every lawyer who's going to court and defending a case, believe me, they'll spend endless hours reading that fine print. Then they could make a case. 
Imagine a lawyer going to court and they did not read those 20 pages. Within the first 30 seconds, the judge will disqualify them. If, if they know, if they discover that the lawyer has no clue what the terms of con and conditions are. So it's really important to raise awareness about God's laws, even simple laws, and the, the Qur'an, that it does come with terms and conditions. So if you, if you have to know all the conditions, like for example, the Salah, the 4,000 conditions, I mean, in, in reality, you're going to put many people, they're going to be scared, not just only scared. Well, like I said, the 4,000, a lot of it is mustahab, uh, basically conditions that so you, you, that you can observe. That the wajib is necessary to know, but the wajib is a lot. When it comes to salah, there are hundreds of limits and conditions for salah. It's important to know them. Doubts in prayer, how to pray, the conditions of wudu and the ghusl. Believe me, most people, every time, every time I do a prayer workshop, people who've been praying for years and years discover they're doing something wrong. That's simple, by the way, not something that you need to, you know, inspect it to figure out that it's wrong. They discover something is wrong that they just had missed. They, they thought they knew it, but they never actually studied it carefully, step by step. So is there a dedicated book out there, Sayyidna, where it actually talks about these 4,000 conditions in layman's terms, or is it something you have to just... In Arabic we do, in English, unfortunately, we don't have something that discusses the 4,000, but we do have books that discuss the wajib at least. We do have, yes. In fact, my dear brothers and sisters, if you just take the book of rulings of your marja, if you just study it line by line, you're good to go, believe me. You don't need anything else. The main laws that you need to know are in there. And if you have any questions, confusion about any of those laws, ask someone. So you're not required to go through 16,000 pages of coffee to discover those terms of conditions. But I recommend you that you, you should though. It's good to go and learn knowledge and examine the actual words of the Imams. But as long as you're taking those limits or conditions or prerequisites from a, an expert scholar, expert marja, that's fine. They've given to you all of that squeezed in one book. And basically, basically most of what you need to know is in the book of rulings, the Risala Amaliyya. It's there. But I ask you the following question. If you were to do a poll, or a survey, people in the community, if you were to poll 10,000 people who do consider themselves practicing Muslims, we're not talking about someone who's secular and doesn't believe in any of this, no, no, people who otherwise believe they are practicing. And if you ask them, have you ever sat down, even in your own language, English, which now it's available in every language, have you read line by line the book of rulings of your marja? What do you anticipate you will get in, in the responses, in the results? One percent. Maybe less. Let's say one percent. I tell you with confidence, more than 95 percent of the people have not actually done that. What's the excuse? You don't understand Arabic? Habibi, it's available in English. You want Urdu? It's in Urdu. You want French? You want Japanese? You want Chinese? It's available these days. Maybe there was some error, it was not. Today everything is available, but we still have not made that effort. Why? Like if Allah really asked me on the Day of Judgment, what's my excuse? What, what is my excuse? I was busy, is there something more important than my religious commitments to Allah? Is there something really more important? I'm willing to sit for three hours and watch a movie. I'm willing to play five hours of sports. How long do you think it takes to read the Book of Rulings? takes 10 years? No. You dedicate your weekends, believe me, within a few months you'll be done with it. Study it line by line. It's as simple as that. But we haven't done that. And that's problematic. The Imam says, look, there are limits. Know them. There's no excuse for not knowing. Yes. Of course, I'm, I'm saying as an easy example. Yeah. Now somebody could say, well, I don't have access to Islamic laws. It, the, the schedule doesn't work with me. Somebody, may, it may not be accessible for them. But I'm mentioning an example that today you could just pull out your smartphone and there's even apps where you can download the book of rulings of your marja and just study it by line, line by line. There is no excuse. But even that people are not doing. But many people don't like reading. So. 
Just no, when it comes to when it comes to what they want to read, they'll read. Harry Potter showed us how kids even are willing to read seven volumes. <laughs> if we'd like to read a novel, we'll read. If it's something interesting. If it's something interesting. Well, this is my religion. By the way, I've seen youth when they start going into a business, they start their career. When they need to read something, believe me, they will read it. They know that they have to read it and they will read it. It's knowing that you need to do that. It's knowing that you need to know that. So we don't really have an excuse in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are, there are programs that you can go to. We have them here at the institute that teach you how to read Qur'an. There are online programs, yes, even with the recitation of the Qur'an. We do have a lot of resources available today that help you read the Qur'an. And there are books of tafsir that give you a commentary of the Qur'an. We do have that, it's available. Here? I mean in terms of books with the tafsir, with the, with the commentary on the Qur'an, yes. We have small commentaries, we have longer commentaries. You want something short, precise, not something too deep, just go to alislam.org or you can buy the book too, buy Puya. By who? Puya, Agha Puya. Puya? Yes. It's the commentary of Puya, that's his last name, P-O-O-Y-A. It's the, the thick Quran, it's here, we used to have it here at the bookstore. You can even buy it from Amazon, but it's available for free on islam.org. Translation? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a translation. The translation is available, it's a commentary. Like a paragraph that tells, that gives you some context, what is the verse talking about, when was it revealed, yes. That's something that allows you to know the Qur'an. It's there, but most people are not probably using such resources. So really, there is not uh, an excuse. Let's now go to this following hadith which is on page 417 tradition 2.20.7 if you go to alislam.org if you if you type the following quran q u r a n dot l dash islam.org you will go to a page where you can search. You choose the surah and the verses. And then there are four boxes to check. Uh, Shakir's translation, Yusuf Ali's translation. These are translations. And then the last one is Puya's commentary. It just gives you the commentary of that verse. Very simple, from your smartphone you can read it. It's easily accessible. So this hadith is from Harun ibn Muslim and Mas'ada ibn Sadaqah from Al-Imam Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. In this hadith, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Qala Amirul al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said the following. And it's a very beautiful hadith. I highly recommend you to read it until page 419. And the Imam is beautifully describing how Allah sent the Prophet as a source of guidance after long periods of ignorance, since the days of Prophet Isa السلام, for like 500 years there was no universal messenger. Confusion happened, people started deviating and corrupting and then this beacon of light emerges and brings us the religion of Islam. So the way the Imam describes it is just beautiful, I would like you to read it. So page 417, 418, when you have time, study the words of Imam Ali alayhi salam, beautiful description of Islam and the Prophet and allows you to appreciate how the Prophet was a source of guidance. But the part in this hadith that I would like to discuss with you is on page 419, the last paragraph of the hadith. So the Imam alayhi salam says, فَجَاءَهُمْ بِنُسْخَةِ مَا فِي الصُّحُفِ الْأُولَى The Messenger of Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he brought to humanity a verified copy of what was in the early scriptures. Remember the Quran builds on early scriptures, it does not negate them, it completes them. So the Quran confirms the truth that Allah had rever revealed in earlier scriptures. And a confirmation of the scripture that preceded it. 
من ريب الحرام and an exposition that distinguishes what is lawful from what is unlawful and unsettling. The Quran gives us the guidelines for that which is lawful and unlawful. ذلك القرآن Imam Ali alayhi salam says that is the Quran. He's describing the Quran in these few passages. Then the Imam says something interesting. فاستنطقوه Ask the Quran to speak to you. So bid it to speak to you. Here we have the Quran. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, command the Quran, request the Quran, bid the Quran to speak to you. In Arabic, the word nataka means what? Speak. Nataka yantuku. Now, once, whenever you put a word in Arabic in istifal format, it means you're seeking it. Alama means he knew. Istalama means what? What? He asked to know. That's the meaning of istalama. Anqadha uh, means to save. Istanqadha means what? Requesting to save. Nataka, speak. Istantaka, asking someone to talk to you. Asking someone to speak to you. Imam Ali salam says, look at the Quran. Ask it to speak to you. Can it? Really, it can? Can you show me how? <laughs> well, these days you have uh, interesting devices. Have you seen the talking Quran? You put the pen on the verse and it reads for you. So these days maybe the Quran can speak, <laughs> but not in the past. Really, if you tell this book to speak to you, is it going to speak to you? Is it? The Imam says, فَاسْتَنْطِقُوهُ Ask it to speak, but it'll never speak to you. What is the Imam trying to say here? Read the next two words. أُخْبِرُكُمْ عَنْ I will let you know about the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a book of guidance. It has the main principles. But the Holy Qur'an is not a book that you can open it and say, Oh Allah, you said this verse, what's the context of it? What is the deeper meaning? Explain it to me. The Qur'an does not explain itself. The Qur'an does not explain itself to you. So the Imam says, then what's the alternative? The Imam says, ask me, I'll tell you about the Qur'an. Because Allah chose us, the Ahlul Bayt, to carry His knowledge. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعَلْمِ Only Allah and those firm in knowledge, pegged in knowledge, they know the deeper meanings of the Qur'an. They can explain the Qur'an. And this is a clear instruction from Imam Ali alayhi salam that you need the Ahlul Bayt as the educators to tell you about the Qur'an and the meanings of the Qur'an and the explanation of the Qur'an. You can't just pick up the Qur'an and say, no, hasbuna kitab Allah, it's enough. The Qur'an does not speak to you. In other words, it will not explain itself to you. So beautiful words from the Imam alayhi salam. Then he says, all that has happened in history is contained in the Qur'an and everything that is come in the future is in the Qur'an. We mentioned earlier in one of the classes how that is the case. How is all the ilm embedded in the Qur'an? If you remember we talked about that. All the laws that are applicable to you, O oh you Muslims, everything you're disputing and arguing about, all of that is mentioned in the Qur'an. The answer to it is in the Qur'an. However, فَلَوْ سَأَلْتُمُونِ عَنْهُ لَعَلَّمْتُكُمْ If you were to ask me about it, I would teach you. سَلُونِي قَبْلَ أَنْ تَفْقِدُونِي Ask me before you lose me. And this Ummah abused the Ahlul Bayt and Imam Ali alayhi salam primarily by not asking them. Allah appointed them as guides who never charged money for anything. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا They never did, acted like they had a favor on anyone. They were accessible. But people abandoned them. People did not know their value. And Allah, till Allah finally decided, you know what, the twelfth one, I'm going to keep him. Humanity, they don't deserve these divine leaders. Imam Ali would say these words and then some of those hypocrites 
those evil people, he would get up and, and tell him, Oh Ali, you know everything? Tell me how many hairs I have in my beard. <laughs> See the abuse? How they're abusing God's gift to them? The Imam told him, under every hair there is a shaitan cursing you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was the best answer, the most intelligent answer any human being can give. What else are you going to tell such a person? And literally, you have to be that evil, of course, to challenge Imam Ali. Under every strand of hair, there is a shaitan cursing you. I'm shaving tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> You're shaving tomorrow. Another shaitan might curse you for shaving if you follow a marja who says you have to. <laughs> so be careful. Question Sayyidina, I mean, uh, the evidence is here in these ahadiths, but uh, do you find that there's an increasing number of folks now out there who are promoting the fact that, you know, you can't really rely on these narrations altogether, and it seems like the audience is increasing, where they just want to boycott narrations altogether? We do see an effort in our modern day world to underestimate hadith, marginalize it to an extent, and just Focus on Qur'an. Well, give me the evidence from the Qur'an. Let's talk about the Qur'an. Don't bring me any hadiths. There is unfortunately such a trend and it's growing. And I have numerous analysis for why this is happening. I think one of it is convenience. Because the Qur'an, remember the hadith by the Imam in which everything has limitations, conditions? Well, the Qur'an doesn't lay out a lot of the conditions explicitly. So it's easy to go with the Qur'an, it's convenient. Because it doesn't lay out all these conditions. Whereas when you go to the hadith, that's your trial. Do you really want to worship Allah the way He wants? Yes, you have to be committed. An easy way to disregard all of those divine conditions is to say, no, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm happy with the Qur'an. I don't need anything else. That is another way of saying, I want the easy way out. I want less conditions, less terms and conditions, less limitations. That's very selfish because they know the Qur'an doesn't mention a lot of specifics. And believe me, you will see the day when millions of Muslims, even the Salah, they were interpreted according to their whims and they will tell you, the Qur'an just says pray. And prayer means just in your heart connect with Allah. You don't have to stand and do wudu and do ruku and sujood. None of that is necessary. And the Qur'an doesn't mention a lot of those acts. The Qur'an doesn't mention the specifics of salah. That day is coming, I'm already hearing. People making these statements, unfortunately. It's, it's convenience. That's one reason. Another reason is there are people who genuinely have not understood the role of hadith and why we need hadith. These examples that we're mentioning in this class, they're not really aware of that. If they were to hear this, if more awareness was to be given to them, they would give more importance to hadith. And then there's a third group of people, they've heard so many things about the world of hadith, Bukhari says this, Kafi this, this, they're just confused. They're like, I don't trust any of these hadiths, who narrated, who narrated them to us, so I'm just not going to give them any importance yet. But this is not acceptable either, you have to research. Because you know for a fact the Prophet and the Imams throughout a period of how many years? 200 years we're talking about. They definitely commented on the Qur'an, they definitely said a lot of laws. So you know that a lot of it has been transmitted to us. You just have to figure out what exactly they said. What is Sahih, what is authentic and what's not. So either go and become an expert and research yourself and you'll find out or rely on an expert. You can't just say I disqualify all of that, that's not fair. Because you know the Prophet gave us more commands than the Qur'an, you know that for sure. What do you think he was doing day and night, giving sermons? He only spoke to the people of that time? Rasulullah is only for that era? He's not for me? People who eliminate the hadith, in essence they're saying Rasulullah is not for me, I don't need him. He was only for that era, because I'm not taking any of his words. The Qur'an is not Rasulullah, the Qur'an is the word of Allah. Not a word from Rasulullah is in the Qur'an, not a word. And every Muslim, you have to be Muslim to believe that. The Qur'an is not the word of the Prophet. The Qur'an is the actual word of God, the Prophet was just a messenger. So if you say, I'm going to close the world of hadith, that means the Prophet is not my Prophet. I don't care about what he said. 
He was limited to that era, some Arabs who were around him, khalas, that's it. Same with the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, 200 years, just for those people. Is that what we believe about our leaders? They were confined to that era? Or they were universal leaders? See, eliminating the world of hadith has all of these ramifications. Are we aware of that or no? It's really important to know these ramifications and consequences. But it's growing, I agree with you. This uh, effort to kind of marginalize hadith altogether is growing and growing. And what really troubles me is that some intellectuals in universities and even, even in seminaries today are gaining prominence. They're bringing these ideas, they're very appealing to the public, so the public is supporting them. The public is waiting by the minute for somebody to pop out of the hausa, the seminary, and say and give you an easy way out for them to immediately support them. And remember, the hausa has over a hundred thousand people. Are you going to expect that every one of them is going to be on the right path? Every one of them is really committed to the path of Ahlul Bayt? Every one of them is getting it right? Of course not. Who said they're infallible? Yes, the vast majority of them are sticking to the main guidelines, but there are a lot of people who are inserting their opinions, who are coming up with their own methods. And the global population today is supporting them because they like that type of mentality. That's easy. That's a dilemma. I'm very, I'm, I'm very honest with you, that is a dilemma that we're having. Some of, some of these people who are saying this, they're educated in Hausa. Just be, be, see, being educated in the seminary does not guarantee you're going to be 100% upright. Look at the Quran and the hadiths speaking about scholars who sometimes take another path. That's important as well. But saying that just analyzing from a logical perspective, or some uh, documented facts and history in terms of what... Uh, the three personalities did back then by trying to burn as many narrations as possible and telling the people to just focus on the Quran. And as time passed by, they noticed that, you know, it, it wasn't enough what they burned. So they noticed narrations were preserved from the different areas altogether. So at that point, I mean, wouldn't you say that it was a brilliant strategy? They said, well, we got to create some fabricated hadith as much as possible to essentially confuse the audience as we can, and this would uh, carry on for ages. And hence the reason why today there is so much doubt. They're like, I don't know which narration to really follow because it's confusing. That's exactly what they did. When they banned the hadith, they realized there was a huge gap. Muslims are coming, newcomers to Islam, they're desperate to know more about this faith, but they don't, there's no substance. Other than the Quran, there's no substance. So for several decades, maybe 10, 15 years, 20 years, they tried to fill that gap with storytellers, especially at the time of the second caliph. He would give them room, especially those who came from Jewish backgrounds like Ka'b al-Ahbar. He would come to the Prophet's mosque and he had the freedom to tell about Jewish stories as he wished. That's why in many of our books, like Bukhari, when I say our, I mean the, the, the global Muslims, right? Otherwise we have a problem with a lot of the hadiths in Bukhari. Many of our books like Bukhari, they do contain these Jewish influenced hadiths. Prophet Musa punching the angel of death, uh, Prophet David committing ex uh, immoral indecency and so on and so forth. Where did they get that from? From these storytellers. But then they realized that's not enough too. They need actual hadith attributed to the Prophet because Muslims were saying, okay, okay, nice stories, but I want to hear something from the Prophet. So that's when the era of fabrication comes. That's where Abu Huraira, after in the beginning he was threatened by the second caliph. He told him, if I hear you narrating one hadith, I'm going to beat you with my stick. Later, when they realized Abu Huraira politically supporting them, he was given permission to narrate hadiths. And then the big disaster came with the Umayyads, where Muawiyah would pay people to fabricate hadiths. And it just continued, continued until the era of Bukhari. Bukhari, you know when Bukhari came? And do you have any idea of like the historical timeline? After 300 years after. Over 200 years after the Prophet. That's when Bukhari came. What happened in those 200 years? If hadith was banned, and if the second caliph says, Hasbuna kitab Allah, 
Bukhari says, I took my hadiths, which is about 5,000 something, if you eliminate the repeated hadiths, 5,000 something. He says, I took these hadiths and I sifted them from 600,000 hadiths. 600,000, 200 years after the Prophet, where did they come from? Who narrated them? Automatically by looking at that quantity, you know there were a lot of fabrications. Now with us Ahlul Bayt, uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we don't have this dilemma because we take hadiths not just from the Prophet, we believe the Imams are extensions of the Prophet's knowledge, so for 200 years the Imams were producing hadiths. So we don't have that dilemma, we don't have a big gap like they do. They have a gap because they're trying to trace every hadith to the Prophet and you cannot with this 100 year ban on hadith and all the fabrications. But we, the Ahlul Bayt, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we have the Imams of Ahlul Bayt who continuously shed light on the Prophet's Sharia. And a lot of them, we get them from an Imam al-Sadiq over a hundred years after the Prophet. See, we don't have this big dilemma. We still have some dilemmas in our hadiths because there were some people who would even attribute false hadiths to the Imams, but we don't have this big dilemma like they do. Because we don't have a 200 year gap. But these facts that you just mentioned, Sayyidina, I mean, these are pretty well documented facts in terms of what has happened historically. Wouldn't this suffice to convince this increasing audience today that are going against narration? This increasing audience, based on my experiencing, they're not having these discussions academically, objectively. They're not. They hear something, they form opinions, and then they go. We're talking about the public, the general public. As for those in the seminary who might have uh, some of these opinions, basically they are aware of, of, of all this discussion, but then they'll go back to uh, issues like, w w I can't trust those early scholars. Kulayni and his understanding of hadith, Tusi and his fiqh, I can't trust them, they were fallible people who committed mistakes. So I just will go to the Qur'an, it's the only source that has no mistakes. This is the idea they're pushing for, unfortunately. It doesn't stand when, they, when, when you put them with the other top scholars who bring forth their arguments, they really don't have an argument against that, but they insist on this opinion, that I don't trust those scholars. So as far as those other because their ideas, I don't trust anyone. That's like their philosophy, I don't trust anyone. I mean, just like they have uh, the shower nights, for example, over Madajan, in terms of documenting these types of facts, don't you think it's about that time of age now where, as far as these individuals go, to perhaps produce works where these discussions are... A lot of scholars in the seminary, they are producing these works. But one thing I found is they don't have a voice. Those others, they might have easier access to media because the media likes controversy. See, right now, I can sit the entire year and teach you something that's not controversial, right? It's not going to t get that much attention or the lectures that we give. But if one day I go on the pulpit and I throw a bomb, as they say, the next day, see the views it will generate on YouTube. Tomorrow if I go on the pulpit, I'm being very honest with you, and I just say, I've done research and I've come to the point where hijab is not wajib. And this is my proof, verse, hadith, whatever, I just fabricate stuff. Next week you'll have millions of views for that clip. You tell me why. Why does the world work that way? That's what they want to hear. You get the idea? So there is a lot of research being produced, but they don't really have this media or the voice to convey that to the public. Or they still have not figured out maybe some, salamu alaykum, some efficient or effective ways. Whereas people of controversy, immediately the spy law designed them. And then everything they say after that, everyone hears it. That's a dilemma. That's a dilemma. It's just as simple as that. <laughs> it's sad, but that's the reality. It's easy to become infamous. One word will make you infamous. So this is a very interesting and important hadith in the book of Kafi. Then let's 
Now go to chapter 21 and start this first hadith and then in next week we'll examine some other hadiths and this is pretty much the chapter that we will conclude uh, the, the book number two for Usul al-Kafi and then we will start book number three for this year inshallah. So on page 437, chapter 21, tradition 2.21.1. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt knew that there will be fabrications in hadith, different readings and perspectives. And so they knew there will be contradictions in hadith. They knew that. How did they address that? We have an entire chapter in the Book of Kafi that tell us how to deal with fabrications, how to deal with discrepancies. I get two hadiths with a solid chain, by the way. To the same Imam or two Imams and these hadiths contradict one another, what do I do? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt have laid down the groundwork for that and the pathway and the method to resolve the contradiction. Very beautiful system by the Ahlul Bayt. SubhanAllah, they are guides for everything. I have no excuse on the Day of Judgment to say, well God I saw conflicting hadith so I lost faith in the whole system. Allah says, well did you read what the Imam said? By the way, I forgot to mention one point from the previous discussion. Some could say this is circular reasoning because you're using these hadiths which are in question themselves to prove what the Imam said about hadiths that are questionable. <laughs> you get the idea? It's circular reasoning. See, going back to that first point that you need hadith and it does not suffice just to look at the Quran. If I had one hadith, two, three, four, five, six, ten, you could say, okay, these narrators conspired, they fabricated these hadiths to say you need hadith and Quran is not sufficient. You could make that argument and so you say, I don't trust this hadith. But if you have hundreds of hadiths from Imam Ali to Al Imam Al Askari throughout a period of 200 years from different backgrounds, different narrators who did not even know one another, and they're narrating hundreds of hadiths from the Ahlul Bayt that hadith is important, our words are important, Quran is not sufficient for you to come up with laws. Have, if for those of you who took the science of hadith two years ago, we examined tawatur, a mutawatur hadith that is successive in its report such that it generates yaqeen and certainty that this happened. Like the event of Ghadir, the event of Ghadir, even Sunni scholars say it happened. Now they have a different interpretation as to what, what Mawla means, but the fact that the Prophet got up and said that this, is not that, this is not something anybody could dispute and say, well I wasn't there, show me footage of that. There is, we have a yaqeen that that happened. You can put your hand on Quran and say, Wallahi Ghadir happened. How? How do you have such certainty? Because so many companions, and narrators from multiple generations have narrated this incident, it's impossible for them to have made it up and conspired, impossible. 10 people can get together and conspire, 20, 30 from one generation, but throughout a period of 200 years, people completely unrelated related from each other, some in Qom, some in Kufa, some in Medina, continuously documenting hadiths, and I remember a lot of them were reliable people that the Imams said the following, the general idea of Quran not being sufficient. See we have certainty about that, I cannot eliminate that certainty, it would be unjust to eliminate that certainty. I have certainty that we have hadiths, investigate. So the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, in many many hadiths they taught us what to do with hadiths that are contradictory. Okay, you could look at tradition 2.221.1 say, okay, this hadith doesn't give me confidence the Imam said that. Okay, there are many more, examine the whole book. And that gives you confidence that the Imams have given us guidelines when it comes to conflicting hadiths. So let's read this hadith. This hadith is attributed to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The Imam says, inni sami'tu min Salmana wal Miqdad. Well, this is from uh, Sulaym ibn Qais. He's saying, Sulaym ibn Qais al Hilali was one of the companions of Imam Ali. Alayhi salam. He says, I heard from Imam Ali alayhi salam, and I told him, Inni sami'tu min Salmana wal Miqdad wa abi dhar shay'an min tafsir al Quran wa ahadith 
عن عن نبي الله صلى الله عليه وآله غير ما في أيدي الناس. Sulaym was a little bit confused. He goes to Imam Ali. He tells him, "I've heard from Salman, from Miqdad, from Abu Dhar. Why these three? These were top companions of Imam Ali, who were entrusted with the knowledge and the secrets of Ahlul Bayt. They had knowledge that the average person in the public did not have, due to their proximity to the Imams." He says, "I hear from these three." things about tafsir of the Qur'an that I don't hear from anyone else. None of the other companions have that knowledge. Then, so I thought maybe, maybe they're fabricating it, maybe. Then I heard from you, O oh Ali, confirming what they say and accepting what they have narrated to me. But then, we have a dilemma. You Ali ibn Abi Talib, you say one thing and these people are saying something else. They have another tafsir of the Quran. And your path is different than their path. And you're claiming that these other tafsirs are batil, they're false. Is this possible? Sulaim ibn Qais is asking Imam Ali, أَفَتُرَى أَوْ تَرَى أَنَّا سَيَكْذِبُونَ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ is it possible that people will attribute lies to the Prophet and inter inject their own opinions in Quran? Is that possible? How is that possible? All these companions, all these people, they decided just to fabricate? I, I, I can't digest what's going on. You Ali ibn Abi Talib, you have certain knowledge about the Quran which is very different than what the people are saying. And you're telling me that a lot of what they're saying is false. So then they deliberately are coming up with these falsehoods? How? Why? I don't get it. It's just basically the Sunni idea today that all of the companions were good. And if you tell them, well, there were groups of companions, they, they just can't grasp it. Why? Why would the companions come up with falsehood? Why? See, they, 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 they have trouble digesting this. Sulaim ibn Qais, according to this hadith, had trouble in the beginning digesting all of this. So he asked this question, he's like, Imam Ali, is it possible they're deliberately coming up with these falsehoods? <laughs> Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam says, you've asked, listen now. I'll give you the answer. The Imam Ali salam briefly tells him, look, what you see people have in the hands of people, in the minds of people, there is haq and batil. Some of it is true, a lot of it is false. There are lies and there are truths. And basically some people have documented well the Prophet, what he has said. Some people have made mistakes in what the Prophet has said. And then he tells him, Sulaim, if you weren't there, I remember, ask. It got so bad during the time of the Prophet himself. عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ عَلَىٰ عَهْدِهِ حَتَّى قَامَ خَطِيبًا فَقَالِ This issue of fabricating hadiths became so serious during the time of the Prophet such that he had to give up and give a speech and he said أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قَدْ كَثُرَتْ عَلَيَّ الْكَذَّابِ Oh people, so many fabricators have emerged. They're attributing lies to me. Then he said the one who deliberately fabricates a hadith and attributes it to me, let him reserve his seat in hell from now. Imam Ali says if during the time of the Prophet this happened, you don't expect this to happen after the Prophet. Just like during his era people made false allegations and fabrications of hadith, after him people did the same. So don't be surprised, O Sulaim. Yes, there are people who deliberately make lies. Why do you think all people are good? Look at the Quran. The Quran in its tone criticizes most people. The Quran in its tone, it has, hadith, it has verses that praise companions, some of them. But the verses of Quran that criticize companions are more than those verses that praise the companions. And I'm willing to challenge anyone on that. I will show you the evidence from the Quran. Just read Surah at tawbah and you'll see. The overall tone of the Qur'an, it, it condemns a lot of those companions for what they were doing, whether hypocrisy, whether problems, whether challenging the Prophet.
The overall tone is more critical of them than it is positive. Go research this important point. And, and, and it's sad that more than one billion Muslims today just completely disregard this. No, no, all the companions, we see them in a positive light. You're directly contradicting the Book of Allah by doing that. Because that's not how the Quran portrays them. Then the Imam السلام, tells Sulaim that hadiths fall in four categories. We have four types of hadith. Very briefly, the Imam says on page 439 in examining category number one. He says the first category of narrators are those who are hypocrites. They don't really believe, but they act as if they believe in order to deceive the people. These people have no piety, no righteousness. They will fabricate lies as much as they want it. And the Quran confirms there were such hypocrites who knew no limits. So yes, there were people like that. Then Imam Ali says, if today the people, the general public, if they knew, if they just had awareness that this person was lying and fabricating, they would not accept their lying, lies and fabrications. But people have been deceived. People have been deceived. They think, oh, this person, out of goodwill, he said what he said, when he was actually lying and he was faking his Islam. If people knew he was really a hypocrite, they would not accept. So the Imam alayhi salam in this hadith is mentioning that there are some companions who saw the Prophet and they knew how to speak very well by the way, they can captivate. By the way, one problem that we have today which beautifully Imam Ali alayhi salam addresses this and the beauty of the book of Kaf is that every scenario we have today you'll find the hadith addressing it. Today you find some people who know how to speak well. They're good articulate speakers, they're motivational, they're powerful in their speech and a lot of people when they hear that are like, wow the fact that this person spoke so eloquently means he's right. My dear brothers and sisters, there is no correlation between eloquence and truth. You could be the biggest fabricator, the biggest hypocrite and you can speak well. Where does Allah mention in the, in the Holy Quran? Imam Ali says, look at this subhanAllah, the Imam, the Imam says Allah exposed them in the Quran and describes them when Allah says وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَهُمْ تُعْجِبُكَ أَجْسَامُهُمْ وَإِن يَقُولُوا تَسْمَعْ لِقَوْلِهِمْ Allah says when you look at them, you're fascinated by their outward appear appearance. They're mesmerizing, in fact they might have charisma. They're charismatic and their words are so eloquent and powerful, you just accept it. Like wow, just listen to this person. There were hypocrites in Medina who were like that. Abdullah ibn Ubay, the leader of the uh, hypocrites in Medina, he was known to be very charismatic and oh boy, he knew how to speak. He was very articulate in his speech and he would gather momentum. People would hear his speech, they're moved by it. Being moved by a speech, my dear brothers and sisters, just because the speaker is eloquent, knows how to talk, is not an indication that he's saying the truth. He could be, he could be playing with your mind. And this is a problem that we have in this era. If I see a speaker who knows how to speak, automatically, yeah, the person knows exactly what he's saying. He, gives, he brings me one verse of the Quran, in a very articulate way, he gives me his opinion, filling it with falsehoods, inaccuracies and I accept it just because he knows how to speak well. Beware of that my dear brothers and sisters. Gauge the speaker based on the content, on the truth, the standard that they're going by. Are they going by the Quranic standard, by the Ahlul Bayt standard or not? That's what you should be looking for. So the Imam salam says one reason why people were duped, <laughs> they were fooled, deceived is because these fabricators knew how to speak. They were effective in their speech so people just followed them. But if people really knew that they were hypocrites, they would not have followed them. So this is the first category of fabricators. Any question about this first category? The second category, he says there is someone a companion who heard this from the Prophet he did not intend to lie but he didn't understand what the Prophet said. 
he mistook the Prophet's words. He didn't get it properly. Because he didn't hear well, or he had weak memory, and after a while you tend to forget. So he started adding things, not deliberately, but because out of forgetfulness. And if people knew that this person is not sharp in his memory, and is not being accurate in his transmission, they would not have accepted it. So the people say, well, he was a good companion. Yes, he may have been a good companion, but remember, he did not have sharp memory. He was inaccurate. Not because he was deliberate, but because that's how he was. That's another reason why we have fabrications or inaccuracies in hadith. The Imam is now explaining the problem here. In later hadiths next week, we'll examine how to know which hadith is fabricated or not. What is the standard that we use? So this is the second category. The third category is one who heard something from the Prophet, but he did not hear the conditions of that law. He did not hear the exceptions the Prophet later made. See, you could, as a legislator, you say the law, then later, in the terms of conditions, you put restrictions. This applies in this case, this does not apply in that case. This companion did not hear that. He came, he saw the Prophet, he heard laws, he was very accurate in his transmission, he did not lie. He preserved, he had sharp memory, he documented it. But the reason why that hadith is inaccurate now to our understanding is because he did not follow up with the Prophet when the Prophet elaborated on those laws and put conditions. Because Islam was given to people gradually. In the beginning you give people the general law, once they get it, they have a deeper understanding, then you give them the specifics of the law. This companion did not hear the specifics of the law, so he never narrated that context, those exceptions, those terms of conditions, and that created confusion for later Muslims. Yes? So I'm not quite understanding the last one. Can you give an example of the last uh, type of narrator? Yes, I'll give you an example. Let's say the hadith says, or the Quran says, when you travel, you break your fast. That's a general law. But then the Prophet on another day, he comes and tells us, if you're a frequent traveler, what happens? You don't break your fast. See? Now, there is an exception being made. That narrator never heard that exception. So if you go by his hadith, you have to fast. I don't care if you're traveling or not, if you're a frequent traveler or not, you have to fast. Another narrator says, no, but the Prophet said if you're a frequent traveler, you have to keep your fast. Now there's a contradiction, do I fast or no? Based on the Qur'an, I need to break my fast, because the Qur'an says if you're traveling, you break your fast. But the Prophet says, yes, but I'll give you some details about this verse. If you're a frequent traveler, or if you work in traveling like a taxi or pilot, then you have to keep your fast and you pray full. That's just a minor example. So these people were not aware of the full set of sharia, they just narrated one part. People heard one part, but not other parts. That, that created confusion and contradictions. That's the third category. The fourth category are those genuine narrators. They never lied. They hate lying and fabrication. They really are mindful of Allah. They have so much respect for the Prophet and they knew the conditions that the Prophet put. They were with the Prophet from day one. And so when they narrate something to you, they narrate it with context. They give you the full picture. If a Prophet placed a condition, they narrate it with, the, with its conditions. These are the companions and the narrators who are the true narrators that we should narrate from. But the question is, my dear brothers and sisters, how many such narrators do we have? How many? Those who say, you know what, I don't need to go to Ahlul Bayt. Khalas, the Prophet is enough. Even some Shias are saying it today. Yeah, the Prophet will, this, the argument is the Prophet is not going to leave with an in incomplete religion. When the Prophet left, he explained everything. Why do I need the Imams for? Okay. My response to them, okay, fine. You want to take everything from the Prophet? Okay. Who's going to narrate to you? Everything the Prophet said in 23 years, knowing all the conditions that he laid out, 
All the explanations, all the exceptions that he made. Who has that type of knowledge? Imam Ali Can you bring me someone other than him who knows all of that? Yes, maybe you could argue some of those very, very early companions who were with the Prophet all the time. Abu Dhar, he came early on. He knows a lot. We trust him. But how many companions do you have like that? Handful? So what do you do? You cannot know what the Prophet really said and what he elaborated and what he stipulated unless you go through the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Because the Prophet said, after me, Ali, I gave him all the knowledge. You take it from Imam Ali and the descendants of Imam Ali. This is another proof from Imam Ali that you need the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. And you cannot say, no, the hadith of the Prophet or the Quran is enough. You have to know the conditions. So the narrators, some of them were truthful, were not doubting their truth, but they don't know everything that the Prophet said and all the conditions that he stipulated. Therefore, I can't just rely on their hadith. I need a holistic view of hadith. You can only get it through the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They give you a holistic understanding of hadith. And that's what, mar what maraja do, my dear brothers and sisters. They spent 50 years trying to holistically understand Islam for us. And they do that work on your behalf. That's what they're doing. Any questions? Objections? Comments? So it's growing. And my dear brothers and sisters, it is my hope that you generation, who are your being, Allah has given you the opportunity to examine texts like these, to know the, the, the school of Ahlul Bayt. It's your obligation in the near future to stand up to the plate and show the knowledge to the people. In your gatherings, in your programs, when you hear these kinds of ideas, it's your obligation. Go on social media, go on YouTube, you see these perspectives flying, do something about it. Present the other side, be active, it's your obligation. Remember it's not just the obligation of a traditional scholar. We mentioned in the Book of Knowledge last year that anybody who has any ilm, any knowledge, it's their obligations to show their knowledge when there's controversy, when there's confusion, when there are doubts. So it is my hope that we all take this and we defend the school of Ahlul Bayt in the face of all these controversies. And they're growing and they're getting more and more challenging. So it's important that we know this. Wa <laughs> Allahumma